we use the term conversational alpha, something that was interesting to talk about. It could be compelling to clients. Uh, and, and that ultimately became your satellite, your thematic satellites. Then Scott, I loved your term uh, conversational alpha, right? That, that's great. I, so we can have that conversation with the clients. So again, conversational alpha, what a great term. And that was Scott Helstein, PhD Executive Director of Thematic Investing with ProShares, and David Carter, CFA, Chief Investment Officer with Lennox Wealth Management. We'd like to thank Scott Helstein and ProShares for sponsoring the live Think Tank Exchange and this podcast. I'm Michael Venuto. And I'm Kudal Wilson. This is episode 202, the Think Tank Exchange podcast. And we're talking about adding conversational alpha by educating and elevating your clients with unique investment stories. Thanks for joining. Mr. Wilson, great to have you co-hosting this podcast with me. Why don't you take a moment and introduce yourself to all of our think tankers out there? It's my pleasure, Benuto, and thanks. Uh, I'm Kadar Wilson. I've been with uh, Toroso Title ETF Services for the last two years. I work with financial advisors when it comes to helping them strategically align their business, streamline their practice, find ways to grow uh, when it comes to client outreach and relationships, and I'm happy to be here. Sounds like you're all about growth. I would say that. (laughs) Yes. Well, that's a perfect segue to reminding our audience that our focus here at the ETF Think Tank Exchange is to provide thought leadership by bridging the gap between investment producers and the advisors who use those products through actionable ideas and real world scenarios. And in this episode, we bring that along with our own Toroso take. So let's jump into the program where the discussion starts by explaining what's on investors' minds, and how conversational alpha plays into that. Here's our own David Armstrong. Dave, what are your investors asking about? What are the things that you can hear them thinking about when they ask you about thematic investing? Most of our investors, you know, they're high net worth individuals. Um, Some are attuned to the market. Some are kind of checked out, right? And, you know, the folks that are attuned to the market see the obvious uh, um, sort of trends, if you will, you know, what's going on with tech and the work from home, you know, nature. How can I benefit from that? But for a lot of our clients that just, you know, read the the New York Times every day, you know, they're they're seeing some of the obvious trends. So I I think it's, again, it's just about being aware of what the broad-based headlines are and where the growth is. The trick really is, is, you know, where's the growth? What is the difference between growth and a good business model? Yeah. So I think, you know, you got you to gotta peel back that onion too. So I think that's where our job comes into play. So, you know, yeah. it's kind of that mix of the qualitative headline and then a little bit of quantitative thought behind that. I, I think David's point about really peeling back the onion and understanding what's in the ETF, how it's constructed and what the logic is, is very important because there are people that are using them for different purposes. And so, for example, uh, the traditional approach might be a core satellite where perhaps you had a core equity allocation. It was either index or some sort of bias towards growth value or sector. And then you went and tried to achieve a little extra alpha or uh, you know, maybe something that was, we use the term conversational alpha, something that was interesting to talk about that could be compelling to clients. Uh, and and that ultimately became your satellite, your thematic satellites. Uh, increasingly, over the course of this year, we've seen thematics move into the core of the portfolio. In the sense, for example, uh, of, of a couple of models that actually traded out of consumer discretionary and moved into e-commerce. Logic being that brick and mortar is a large part of the consumer discretionary brick and mortar retail. And so uh, if you are evaluating your future opportunity, and certainly as COVID hit, an industry that was already under pressure uh, really struggled. We saw a a record number of bankruptcy and store closures in in recent history, um, or or a a, a max, at least, is what we've seen in in the trend, uh, a high point. And so you had investors, you know, serious investors asking themselves, whether the e-commerce space was a better allocation than consumer discretionary as a whole. And they 
decided the answer to that was, was yes. And so, you know, as the economy drives towards efficiency and we're identifying winners and losers faster, I think that that increases the interest of having a thematic exposure um, in the hopes, again, you peel back the onion, you decide what degree of concentration you want, you decide whether you want to be allocated to the smaller emerging or the larger mega winner take all winner take all you know uh, tech platforms, but you know you can make that decision consciously as opposed to uh, you know just just sort of weighing in. David, you're the advisor in the group. Helpful. Yeah, it, it, it's really helpful. And, and, and Scott, I loved your term, uh, conversational alpha, right? That, that's great. I, I, you know, are, we ba- are we buying an e-commerce fund, but even though it's broadly diversified, so we can have that conversation with the client of, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're e-commerce focused. But again, when you peel back the onion, it's not quite so much. So again, conversational alpha, what a great term. This whole first section on conversational alpha is about using themes to connect with clients, but it also gets deep into, you know, how do you use a theme in an actual portfolio Uh, beyond thinking of it as core satellite and things and strategic allocations like that. Way back in episode 104 of the Think Tank Exchange, we had Sam Rossi from American Portfolios Group talk about how to tactically invest in themes. And, you know, uh, Mike, that's a good point. I get these questions all the time from advisors on ways that they can position thematics into their portfolios. Uh, They use it, no pun intended, as conversational pieces (laughs) when it comes to having conversations with their clients, considering how neat some of these thematic ETFs can be uh, and clients being in specific industries or having certain uh, interests. Advisors definitely use these type of thematics when it comes to having conversations with their clients. Yeah, I mean, themes are more than just an investment, right? They're they're a way to connect, um, and they're here to stay. You know, we wrote a, a blog piece in the ETF Think Tank about last year's launches. Nineteen percent of them were thematics. That's a lot. Uh, you know, considering that there was only five sector ETFs launched in 2020, and o- almost 50 thematic ETFs launched in 2020, it seems to me advisors have to pay attention. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, as I said, it's 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 a very a conversational piece most of the times, considering clients are in niche industries as well, and some some thematics uh, are catered to those specific industries. Yeah, so um, this is kind of has a connection to the the Warren Buffett concept of invest in what you know, right? Uh, our our advisors need to be educated on the themes that their clients are interested in. And that's why we do these shows. So this is the perfect segue to lead into segment two of the podcast, taking a deeper dive into thematics. And our very own Dan Weisskopf uh, heads up this segment. So Scott, um, how are you guys approaching through your index uh, a balanced approach to the thematic space? So so, um, we... uh, we actually decided that we were not going to try across these, you know, four areas of transformational change that we were not going to try and pick the winners because we think that there is a long trajectory to all of these. And so if you were to ask me right now, the two that I think are most important, I would probably point out the future of work. And I would talk about genomics and telehealth because that's front of mind. Three years from now, it might be the food revolution. That is more important because we, according to the UN, there's going to be 2 billion more people in the world uh, by 2050. That, by the way, is almost 200,000 new mouths to feed every day. And we need technology. We already use uh, half the habitable land in the world for food production. So we, we, we have to find efficiency somewhere. So what we've done is we decided we were going to allocate 25% to each of the themes and the themes get rebalanced twice a year uh, to that 25. Uh, And therefore, we're not necessarily trying to pick a winner between them. We're saying we think they're all important. And, uh, you know, at any given time, uh, one might be, you know, or two might be doing better than than the others. So, Scott, then, is this is this a, a, a lower beta thematic investment? Is that the way to think about this? 
Um, this is the most diversified and uh, least concentrated of the thematics that ProShares have launched. Uh, right now, there's uh, roughly about 140 names, and that number can, uh, you know, oscillate a little bit up or down. But the idea was really to provide people with, I don't want to say a pandemic ETF, because we're not it, we're, we're not profiting, right, or looking to profit off of doom and gloom, uh, you know, and certainly we're all looking forward to the day when we've got vaccines and, and we're back to normal. What we're trying to do is identify areas where the pandemic really accelerated, right, really pulled forward the, the evolution in behavior uh, and in, in the use of technology. And so, uh, Given that it, it does cut across four different areas, uh, it is a little bit more diversified than some of the other thematics that we've launched so far. And yet, still not as diversified as, as David implied, um, as some of the ETFs that you look at, you peel back the onion, and there's 400 names that begins to have a, a very index-like characteristic. So we're really trying to you know, kind of find a middle ground between that. David, you're the advisor in the group. Helpful? Yeah, it, it, it's really helpful. I and mean, I guess sometimes what we find from an advisor perspective, you know, when we're looking at uh, at the products or at the funds, and let's just stick with e-commerce for a minute, um, you know, again, the qualitative headline sounds great. You know, a client can pick up on that and they ask the question, you know, hey, I'm, I'm buying so much more on e-commerce. How are you guys benefiting from that? But then sometimes when we look at the product, um, again, with e-commerce, and I'm just making this up, um, you know, Walmart may be in there because Walmart, sure, has a big slug of e-commerce, but it's not really how Walmart trades. And, well, I don't think that's how Walmart, you know, the name trades. And I'm not, my, I'm just guessing, let's say, you know, e-commerce is, you know, 30% of their total business. The best, the rest is traditional retail. So... I guess what I'm wondering is, is, is how do you decide, you know, how much of the name has to be in that theme as opposed to, oh, some of it's in there, slap them in there. It's like Exxon might have, you know, a couple of hydrogen pro projects and, oh, they're green. Well, oh, wait a minute. Now, so if, when you're building the, the product, you know, where do you draw that line? How much of the, how much of the individual names has to be exposed to that theme? So David, that's a great question. So let's, let's take e-commerce. Um, so the approach at ProShares was to build a product that only included digital natives, i.e. business models that were solely created in order right, for the e-commerce space. So for example, uh, in our e-commerce ETF, we do not have Walmart. And we hear all the time, as you were right, well, Walmart is the second largest e-commerce company in the US. Um, and that might be true, but if you actually look at the margins of Amazon versus Walmart, Walmart has achieved that position at the expense of their profitability. So their margins have consistently gone down, where Amazon's over the same time period have moved up. And so um, they're very sympathetic to that concern that you might not be getting uh, everything you hope for when you look under under the under the hood. And that's why that's why we adopted the the digital native only uh, only approach in in that portfolio. Um, when we look at something like the multi thematic, uh, where uh, there is actually a, a, a effectively a cutoff uh, based on the revenue drawn from the individual themes, and so if you're not drawing at least essentially fifty percent of your revenue uh, from those themes then you're, you're not eligible for inclusion. And what we find, given the way that we've scoped it, because we started with these things like high-level future of work, but then drill down to be able to say, well, what does that involve? It involves automation. It involves artificial intelligence and machine learning. It involves cybersecurity and digital payments. And then by going through that and, and kind of building the ecosystem of the multi-thematic, it allows us to, to you know, try and target those companies that really have a higher alignment with with the theme. But it's a very important consideration. As an advisor, that's great to hear. That's great to know. You know, at least for us, 
we're less interested in that so-called conversational alpha where we're just, we're all kidding ourselves, right? <laughs> oh, we're making a big play on e-commerce, which really you're not. Let's, let, let's not get ourselves. So it's great to know that you have, you're a little more careful. You have some requirements for the, for the individual names to be in the portfolio, in, in the fund. If I can get kind of wonky for a minute, you know, we certainly think about allocation, how much of our allocation should be to thematic stuff. But I guess on your side, you know, is, is you're building an ETF. Um, how do you decide how much to put in one name or another? Are, are you like trying to optimize it a little bit, or how do you think about the allocation within in the fund? We have not done a uh, one size fits all in that we have not adapted a we're going to be solely market cap weighted or we're going to be solely equally weighted or a modified market cap. Uh, for example, on the multi-thematic, it is a modified market cap um, based on uh, the size of the company and the thematic relevance, but we've also capped the largest allocation at 2%. So at the time, you know, twice a year, no matter what it is, the largest companies in there will, will, will reset to two, which means that there will be consistent allocation to some of what we think of as the smaller, newer, higher growth players. Um, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's one approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. It does give you the benefit of recognizing that there is a winner take all dynamic in some of these businesses or historically there has been. Uh, with some of these major platforms so that you're giving them the, the credit. And yet, nonetheless, you're trying to make sure that you're giving investors um, exposure to names they probably don't already own or that they might not find elsewhere. And so yeah. we think that's important. And some of the more concentrated portfolios, that's where you might see something that is more of a market cap weight. Unless, of course, we have a really good reason for saying that just the, the distribution of market cap is unequal. And, you know, we really want to identify a product that's going to give people exposure, again, to some of those things they don't have. So for us, that's part, it's, it's not a one size fits all. That's part of the construction process to try and find the, the best way to, to bring out the product. Wow, they covered a lot there. Uh, before we unpack it, I want to thank uh, Scott Helfstein and ProShares for sponsoring the Think Tank Exchange today. But I want to hone in on one specific issue here brought up by Mr. Carter, which is, you know, if I'm buying something that's thematic, do I really want it to be watered down by old economy companies that may have 10% in that theme? Uh, I find this really, really interesting. Do you get these questions from advisors as well, Kadar? No, absolutely. Advisors are constantly uh, looking and taking a deeper dive into the portfolio mix and the index itself. Um, and that's something that uh, Dan Weisskopf and the portfolio managers, Michael Guyad here at the ETF Think Tank, definitely help them navigate, especially when it comes to our ETF Think Tank tool and technology that allows them to take that deeper, deeper dive and to look at what the percentage weightings are um, along with, of course, expense ratios. Yeah, and expense ratios are, are something that that you know thematics are a little bit rich on usually, right? However, it's not just about the expense; it's what you're getting for the expense. One of our favorite tools that we use at the ETF Think Tank in our software is what we call the Smart Cost Calculator, and that's where we identify the active share of a, of an ETF and calculate the fee you're paying for the the thematic part or the active part. How much I shouldn't be paying much to get S and P exposure, but if I'm getting something that's 98% unique, I want to know what I'm paying for that unique part of the portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and there's also the concentration tool. I think that that's normally that's usually very valuable to advisors as well, which is another feature and function of the ETF think tank platform. Um, and that shows you uh, I'd use the Herfindale Hirschman index, and it really shows you the concentration from a market share perspective um, in, in the portfolio. If you can touch on that, Mike. Sure. I, can, I don't know if I can say Herf, Herfman Hirschenfeld. <laughs> no, I'm say just that, kidding. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> yeah, say that one 10 times fast. Uh, it's beautiful because it's got an acronym, HHI index. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I really like how Carter identified the problem and how Scott Helfstein discussed 
ProShares approach to looking at digital natives, people that are actually dedicated to the theme. And let's move on to the third part of our program, which covers asset allocation. David, we shouldn't leave a discussion about investments without thinking about asset allocation. I always think advisors, if they are interested in a particular idea, want to think about where does it fit in my portfolio. Obviously, this is an equity-oriented strategy, Scott, so that answers part of the question. But then the next question becomes, then, how do you weight it? Uh, And David, is that something that you have addressed in the way that your firm thinks about uh, thematic investing? Yeah, great question. I think, you know, the way we think about it is um, it makes sense in a portfolio, the notion of thematic investing. And I think the comment there is thematic investing, which would suggest we don't want to do just one. You know, we don't want to do just e-commerce. So just I'm just picking numbers here. Let's just assume we want 6% of the portfolio to be in thematic ideas and to be in some of those more uh, focused ideas. So they're going to have a little vol to them, right? We're mm-hmm. fine with that. But like building a stock portfolio, if it's going to have a lot of vol, you know, we want to have some diversification in there. So I think if we did a 6% allocation to thematic ETFs, we're probably like, very likely to look at at least three different funds in that space and you know, 2% each. It might be e-commerce, genomics, and, um, and pet health. Um, but we'd, we'd be reluctant to put one thematic idea in there. I think we'd think of it more as a portfolio approach and more of a basket. Again, particularly if they're what I call real thematic plays where there's some focus um, on, on the theme. Scott? You're the only one with a PhD in this panel. Uh, and so I don't want to go too geeky with you, but uh, any reflections on the way that David and other advisors are thinking about allocating to thematics from your perspective? So I think David's point of the degree of concentration that you're adding with thematics is uh, is quite valid. And uh, if you were to ultimately take a... Um, a portfolio of thematics, and you were to add in six, eight, ten. At what point, to uh, you know Dan's comment earlier, do you just have something that starts to look like a diversified portfolio? And if you have a strategy consciously built around the fact that you want a diversified portfolio, but you want to use thematic exposure to do it then I think that that's a perfectly reasonable but building a portfolio of thematics that, you know, is put through the right set of tests um, in order to give you something that is a, a diversified equity allocation, but perhaps gives you the opportunity, again, checking the correlations and all of that, gives you the opportunity to, you know, to, to maybe pick up a little extra is, is one approach. Um, and if not, I think David's spot on that you can identify your favorite two, your favorite three thematics uh, and say, this is going to be my, my 10 or 15 percent. Um, so it is it is something that, um, uh, that that we have looked at before. And I think the key is that there's really no one size fits all. There are a few different ways to go about it. Um, and, you know, all of those, I think, just should be done with an eye towards, you know, risk management, understanding what each individual product is and how it's fitting together as a whole. In this last segment, we're covering the age old question of, all right, I get it. I need to have themes. How much do I put? Where do I put? Where do I take from? And I think they did a great job of giving some good real world examples. Yeah, yeah, good point, Mike. Uh, Actually, with the hundreds of advisors that I've crossed paths with over the last two years uh, working with ETF Think Tank, uh, we see varying numbers when it comes to their allocation portion, whether it's in thematics or just ETFs overall. We we see a a significant range between 7% uh, to 15% uh, when it comes to the ETF portion of the portfolios, but some advisors have 100% uh, into ETFs. So it's normally, it's very interesting to see how advisors kind of allocate towards ETFs, particularly in the thematic space as well. It is unique though, because, you know, 
there have been a few thematic mutual funds, but it never really took off like that. Um, when you get to ETFs, because the value props include things like exposures, uh, the adoption curve of ETFs has actually been enhanced by the use of thematics. You know, and at the ETF Think Tank, we acknowledge that all advisors are different. Uh, what we do is help them uh, enhance uh, that difference, especially when it comes to helping them navigate the variety of clients they may have and making sure that their portfolios are a reflection of that. Yeah. So now we move to Dan Weisskopf, as we always like to close by acknowledging a good cause. Our ETF think tank is about giving and sharing. You know, in in the spirit of that, we always like to close with a discussion um, and an opportunity uh, to give um, to a charity. So, David, which charity should we be recognizing um, here today? You know, I've been in the past. I've been involved with, which I think is a great organization, and that's the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. I think I think they do help kids and give them a better shot. So, if you could help there, that'd be that'd be great. Well, as we wrap up this episode, we'd like to thank ProShares for sponsoring this podcast and the live show. You can learn more about the ETF Think Tank and the Think Tank Exchange by visiting etfthinktank.com your source for ETF ideas, thought leadership, strategies, tools, and growth tactics. And that's because our value proposition is to enhance yours. I'm Kadar Wilson. And I'm Michael Venuto. Keep the exchange going with your clients. Until next time, take care. The views and opinions expressed during this event are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the sponsor or organizer. Information set forth during this event has been obtained or derived from sources believed by the participants to be reliable. However, neither the sponsor nor the organizer make any representation or warranty express or implied as to the information's accuracy or completeness, nor does the sponsor or organizer recommend that the information shared during this event serve as the basis of any investment decision, and it has been provided to you solely for informational purposes only, and does not constitute an offer or solicitation of an offer or any advice or recommendation to purchase any securities other than financial instruments and may not be construed as such.